Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Jason. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be watching the Bruins tonight at 6.30 because I don't know if I can take it. Um, anybody think they can actually handle that game today? <laughs> you can do it. Okay, you're hardcore. I just, I don't know. Uh, Paul and I love hockey. We love the Bruins. And after the other night's game, I was like, I don't think I can watch on Sunday. Maybe I'll check in, and if things are looking good, I'll, I'll watch. I don't know yet. So my name is Rachel Jackson. I am a member of the teaching team. I think it was back here with you guys uh, late January. Um, I'm thrilled to be here today um, to continue the second week in our series, Truth Bomb. Truth bombs are, are tough, tough statements, and um, I get to handle one. I handed off the, tough one, the, the hardest ones to Pastor Mike. He said, here, you get first pick. And I said, well, I don't want that one. <laughs> I went, I'll take that one. So, um, so I get to do that today, and we'll get to that in a minute, but let's pray. Holy Father, I just thank you for this morning so far. I thank you for the worship this morning. I thank you for those songs, the richness of them. And I thank you for your love. And I pray that when we um, leave today, that each one of us will understand just a little more clearly and a little more deeply your love for us, which will fuel our love for you and our love for others, Father. May your word speak to us today. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Okay. So when I was working in Dallas for an accounting firm, uh, we hired a new colleague. It was a woman, and she was an avid rock climber. She decided that all the women in our group needed to go rock climbing and learn how to rock, climbing, rock climb. We were a very tight-knit group. Um, and so she booked a trip with her rock climbing instructor for all the ladies in the group. So one Friday night, we all piled into a car. We drove north to Oklahoma. We called all the guys in our group and left voicemails singing at the top of our lungs, I will survive, which on Monday morning, they were like, what was that all about? <laughs> we slept in a wild, in tents in a wildlife refuge uh, with free roaming bison going through the tents. That was an interesting experience. And the next morning, we got up on Saturday morning and we started our hike to our first rock face. We had Christy with us. Christy was the member of our group who was the fashionista. So you can imagine, we're getting ready to hike to our first climb, and Christy shows up in high-heeled sneakers. I kid you not, the sneakers had rubber heels like this. And we said, Christy, do you want to like, change into something maybe more appropriate for the, for the hike to the climb? And she said, what do you mean? This is all I brought. So we get to this rock face. Thankfully, it wasn't a very long um, hike. But I, I discovered the second problem with inviting Christy on this trip, and you have to understand, she's one of my dearest friends, I love her to pieces, but she's very social, and she was my belayer. So this is my first time rock climbing, and she's down belaying me, and she's chit-chatting away with all of our friends, and that's me, the little dot, the really small dot when I got to the top, and I'd be halfway up and I'd be like, uh, Christy, are you paying attention to me at all? And she'd go, oh, sorry, 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 yeah. And I didn't take to rock climbing, let me put it that way. And what I learned is, you know, it's very unnerving to be going up the rock face when the rope is slack, because your belayer has to like let out rope so you can go up, and as you're feeling the rope slack, you're just like, I hope this catches me. If I fall, I hope this catches me. But it's so interesting, because when the rope goes taut, like when you're rappelling down and the rope is taut, you could dangle there all day and feel perfectly secure. When a climber hangs on a rope, he wants that rope to feel secure. Anytime we hang our full weight on anything, we hope and trust that that rope, what we're hanging on, is going to hold. And the same can be said about life. We hang our lives on lots of things. We hang our life maybe on our wealth, on our power, on our influence, maybe on our virtue, maybe on our religion. Some of us hang on our religion, our faith, our set of traditions and practices that we hold dear. And as we climb through, through life, we hope that whatever we're hanging on will hold. And we often find out the hard way that some things hold and some things don't. We're in the second week of our series, Truth Bomb. A truth bomb is a blunt, undiplomatic statement of something that is true that others may not want or expect to hear. We're in the section of Matthew 
where Jesus is tangling with the religious leaders of his day. He, relig he tangled re with religious leaders constantly. We're in a particularly contentious section right now. Last week, Pastor Mike preached on the challenge Je Jesus received from rel religious leaders trying to catch him in a political conundrum. This week, we're going to take a little jump to Matthew 22, verse 34. And next week, pa or in the coming weeks, I think maybe next week, Pastor Mike will go back and catch us up with verses 23 to 33. We're going to start with verse 34. So let's pick up with Jesus' continued conversation with the religious leaders of his day. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now just to give you some context, this section starts off with hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. The Sadducees and the Pharisees were two religious sects of the day. The Sadducees tended to be more elitist and aristocratic. The Pharisees were more representative of the common working people. And I think, class, I think that's why we hear a lot more stories about Jesus tangling with the Pharisees. He was probably more likely to run into them. But make no mistake, the Sadducees were a religious force. They were religious leaders and high priests and chief priests. And they often challenged Jesus and his ministry. So in the preceding passage, which we'll catch up on another week, the Sadducees were trying to pull Jesus into, the, his, into a conversation about what happens to us when we die. And they were trying to pull him into a conversation they thought he couldn't win. But Jesus always wins. Because he knows everything there is to know about the earth, and he knows everything there is to know about heaven. So he had won. Enter the Pharisees. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. It's like he's in a, den, a pit of vipers, right? He crushes the head of one, and the other one comes right back at him. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. So let's just sit on this for a moment. If you've been walking with us through the book of Matthew, you know that the Pharisees are constantly being schooled by Jesus, but they keep coming back for more. So a Pharisee asks a question and go, that goes straight to the heart of their religion. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus takes them all. I'm assuming the Sadducees are still hanging around. I don't know for a fact, but they're probably all still there. And he takes them back to their own scriptures. And he quotes Deuteronomy 6, 5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength, all your soul and with all your strength. And then he quotes Leviticus 19, 18. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. But I love what he says after that. He says, all the law, and there were a lot of laws, and all the prophets hang on these two commandments. Mark's account of this interaction goes a little, gives us a little bit more of the conversation. Well said, teacher, said the expert in the law. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other like him. To love him with all your heart and all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all the burnt offerings and all the sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said, you are not far from the kingdom of heaven. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. So I noticed a few things in this interaction. One, Jesus answers their questions with, a script, with scripture. Two, he answers the question with authority, and he both encourages and challenges that expert in the law. When he says, you are not far from the kingdom of God, he's making his own loaded statement. Theoretically, you get it. You kind of get it. You know that to love God and, and love others trumps rituals and tradition of your religion. You seem to understand the essence of passages like Micah 6, 8, which says, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit, fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. 
You seem to get that. So you're close to the kingdom of God. But Jesus doesn't say, you get it. You're in the kingdom of God. He says, you kind of get it. You're close to the kingdom of God. If I was that Pharisee, I'd be a little offended right now. Because I'm pretty sure I'm in the kingdom of God. I can only guess that Jesus is saying, you get it up here, but you don't yet get it down here. This is head knowledge for you, but not yet heart knowledge. Love hasn't pierced your heart. And that brings us to our truth bomb. All religion is pointless. It's pointless if it's hanging on the wrong rope. It's pointless if it's hanging on a fraying rope. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep one's self unstained from the world. Do you love God and others enough to bridle your tongue, to care for the vulnerable and marginalized in their affliction? affliction? If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast about it, but do not have love, I gain nothing. If I do not have love, I am nothing and I gain nothing. It's all pointless. Religion is pointless if it doesn't care about justice, if it's devoid of mercy, if it lacks humility, if it's steeped in anger and causes fights. If those who do not know God point to those who know God and conclude that our religion is the problem in the world, our religion is pointless. Both the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the most religious among the people, were hanging their religion on being experts in the law and on their ability to keep the law. But they were hanging on a fraying rope. It's a fraying rope that we as Christians can sometimes also hang on because some of us are all about the rules. We know the rules, we love the rules, we think we're doing a pretty good job of keeping the rules, and we love pointing out when other people are not keeping the rules. Or some of us are all about the rituals and traditions. We're proud of the fact that we never miss a Sunday, that we volunteer, that we tithe our 10%, and that we buy shoes and, and clothes and coats for every outreach that comes along. We hang our lives and our religion on those things as we climb towards heaven, but at some point in life, we are likely to lose our grip on the rock face. And when we do, those things cannot bear our weight when we fall. Those ropes can't hold us. When I was in college, one of my closest friends was the son of missionaries. They were such a lovely, outwardly perfect family until the day that he received a call from his parents that his brother had been arrested for holding up a donut shop at knife point. In that moment, just like that, his parents lost their grip on the rock. We don't see moments like that coming. Nobody saw that coming. Nobody could have predicted that this lovely Christian family with parents who loved their children, were missionaries, who went to church every Sunday, would have a son who would spend the next three years in prison. Those years of going to church and celebrating the Christian traditions and doing all the things that Christian families do did not stop them from falling off the rock. When it happened, it plunged the family into a crisis of faith. Life has a way of knocking us off the rock face when we least expect it. When we've been hanging our religion on anything other than God's love, we can find ourselves hanging on a fraying rope. Maybe you've been hanging your faith on all the shouts and shout nots, and you think you've been doing a pretty good job of it. Why can't everybody else get it together? It's not that hard. Or maybe you're hanging on the rituals and traditions, and they feel comfortable, and they feel workable. And maybe you feel like you don't even need religion. I mean, you don't have a faith. Or maybe you've been living without Jesus for a while and life seems to be going okay. I mean, is it really necessary? It seems kind of pointless. 
and then suddenly something goes very wrong. You make a bad decision. Someone you love heads down a shameful path. Life gets busy. And you're going through a divorce. Or you have a child-threatening self-harm. Or your finances are in disarray. Suddenly you feel very vulnerable hanging out on that rock. Hanging to the cliff. Suspecting you're about to fall and desperately hoping that the rope that you're clipped to is going to hold you. But that rope starts to fray. If you fall, will the rope you're hanging on hold you? When I was in college, I have a lot of college stories, I transferred from a university in the northern of California to a university in Southern California. I did not want to do this, but I changed my major and I had no choice. So on my first day of school in Southern California, I went to the student union. It was raining, I was alone, it was miserable, and I felt very sorry for myself. And a woman came up and sat next to me, friendly face, started chatting. I was like, this is a gift. And she invited me to a Bible study. She was a Christian. She invited me to a Bible study. I was so thrilled. So I went to this Bible study, and I, what I didn't notice in this Bible study is that the only person answering questions was me. They were directing all of their questions to me. It wasn't really like a discussion. And at the end of the Bible study, the leader looked at me and said, Rachel, you're going to hell. <laughs> I was like, what? I did not see that coming. So I went through all the questions, and it was a very strategically crafted set of questions that were intended to make me contradict myself. So my last statement contradicted my first statement, and she caught me. It was like what these Pharisees were trying to do to Jesus, but it didn't work with him. It worked with me. <laughs> I went back. I, couldn't, I, I don't think well on my feet, so I went back to my... I said, okay, hold that thought. I'm coming back in a week. And I spent the next week with this Bible, this specific book, this is before the internet. All I had was the index in the front and the concordance in the back. And I spent more time in this Bible going, what do I believe? What am I hanging on? Like, how did she do that to me? I, I'd been a Christian my whole life. I gave my life to Christ when I was five. Like, what's going on? So I went back in a week, and I was like, all right, I had my list of verses. And she sat down. She had the same list of verses. She cut me off at the pass. She had answers to every defense. I had. Before I even made my defense, I was like, oh. So I stupidly agreed to meet with her again with one of her leaders. Because if the first two didn't go well, meeting with another, like multiple people was going to go even better. And I went, I spent more time in this book. And we met at an in and out off of I-10 in Los Angeles. It was her and two male leaders. And for two hours, they terrorized me. There were two LA cops at a table across, I was like, does anybody see that I need some help here? <laughs> and finally, I said to her, okay, I give up. I'm going to hell. You're right. Tell me what I need to do right now. What do I need to do right now to be saved? And they said, you need to be baptized into our church. It's a ceremony you'll never forget. Yeah. And I went, I don't know a lot, but I know that's wrong. I got up, and I walked out. For a month, they left horrible messages for me on my answering machine. What I did not know is that I had just had a run-in with a cult. But what was it that kept me hanging secure? I was 21. I did not have a theology degree. What was it in this book that kept me hanging securely when I had, was experiencing a crisis of faith? It wasn't all the verses about what you should and should not do. It was the verses about God's love for me. So when I have friends now that are going through their own crises in life or in faith, I take them to passage like, passages like, you have been saved by grace through faith. It's a gift of God. Or the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Or he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers his lambs in his arms and he comes and he carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those who have young. Each even verses that don't specifically use the word love are infused with God's love. It's those passages that keep people holding on because the rope of God's love does not fray. Jesus does not, in his interactions with the Pharisees, he does not dismiss the law or the prophets. 
He simply says that they all hang on the rope of God's love. Any rope not entwined with his love is going to fray. So let's take a look at some of the verses that speak about what a faith based on loving God and loving others looks like. Love helps us to know God. Friends, let us love one another, for God, love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love God does not know God, because God is love. If you want to know God, immerse yourself in his word. Read his word and immerse yourself in his love. Love builds relationships. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. God forced a relationship with us through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, and we honor that by infusing his love into our relationships with others. Love refines us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in, in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. So what does it look like to be like Jesus? Therefore, if any of you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. And of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Do you want to be like Jesus? Let God's love refine you to be more compassionate, less selfish, less vain, more humble, and more likely to look out for others than you are to look out for yourself. The more we look like Christ, the more everything about our lives, including our relationships, will be transformed. Love drives out fear. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Now, we live in a scary world in a divided country. It's easy to react to all that's going around us in fear. And it's really easy to create fear in others. People should not fear us. If we know Jesus Christ and we are becoming more like Christ, they should not fear us. Our friends should not be afraid to come to us when they hit real life issues that are really messy in their lives. Our family members shouldn't be afraid to invite us to Thanksgiving dinner. Our neighbors should not fear that we will not stand in the gap for them when they or their, or their children are feeling vulnerable or under attack. We may not like it, but right now in our current climate, people who do not know Jesus often expect Christians to show up on the scene with spears instead of sh with shields fashioned out of God's love. There is no fear in love, we will never have the opportunity to see people refined and perfected in God's love if we behave in ways that make them fear us and him. Love destroys hypocrisy. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Now, I doubt any of us would say that we hate people. That seems like a very harsh thing to say. But there seems sometimes to be a disconnect between our stated love for God and our be outward behavior towards people. So, for example, when we are unwilling to bridle our tongues, particularly on social media, we kind of make it seem like we hate people 
even if we say we love them and we love God. And I've had to do a lot of soul searching around this one. I'm not a naturally loving person, right? So what am I doing that makes people feel like I don't love people? Like, Lord, help me to be a better lover of people. Help me to love people the way you love people because I don't want to be a hypocrite. Although I can definitely think of times in the past when I have been one. Love unites. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentle and gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. God's love is interwoven with and wrapped around so many of these virtues. No wonder the rope of his love is so strong. And finally, love encourages. This is Paul's letter to the Ephesians, Church of the Ephesians in Ephesus. Let's read his words. They're so encouraging. I pray that out of God's glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have the power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and high and deep is the power, is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Paul's words to the Ephesian church are dripping with affection and encouragement. He loves them. But more than that, he wants them to know the depth of God's love for them. Have you asked God to help you understand the depth of his love for you? Like the sheer magnitude of his love for you? It's impossible to not respond to that. Do you pray that the people in your life, those who know Christ and those who don't know Christ, would come to fully understand, to come to understand and grapple with the magnitude of his love for them? When was the last time you encouraged someone, like Paul encouraged the Ephesian church? When did you last encourage someone who was losing his or her grip on the rock face? When did you last urge them to hang on to the rope of God's love while you reached over the precipice to help them up? My friend's family that was thrown into that crisis when their son was thrown into prison, they responded by leaning into God's love. They spent the next three years of his imprisonment pouring God's love into their son and literally loving him back to life in Jesus Christ. And he now has a thriving relationship with Jesus. He's got a job. He has a family. They have loved him back to life. He knows the power of God's love. When our faith in God builds relationships, makes us look more like Christ, drives out fear, destroys hypocrisy, creates unity, and encourages others to seek and strengthen their own relationship with God, we are no longer going through the motions of a pointless religion. We have established a faith changed and fueled by God's love. That's not pointless. That's powerful. <laughs>